Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number 877-973-7425. Listeners in Vidalia, Georgia. WVOP, if you're listening, none of you that I can tell have taken action yet uh, to tell your state representatives to support SB 233 in Georgia. If you text the word engage to 33777, you can get your state rep down there in Vidalia to support school choice legislation in Georgia. Text engage to 33777. Now, one of my favorite people ever to get elected to office who is too nice to be an elected official and yet is, God has blessed us with his presence, the senator from the great state of South I don't think I can build up an intro better than that. Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, one of my favorite people on the planet. Welcome. Eric, it is all downhill from here. <laughs> What an amazing introduction. I will only say in response, even before you said a word, I had written down, Eric is a common sense champion who is steeped in homework. Well, that is what I think of you. I appreciate it a ton. Uh, mutual admiration society here. In all seriousness, though, I, I, I really, my wife and I have had this conversation about you that uh, whenever she gets so cynical about American politicians that there are just no happy warriors left, I was like, you really got to – if we can get you to the conference in August, my wife's got to be there to meet you. She's going to love you. I've got to be there. I'm doing everything in my power to be there. I'm looking forward to being on stage with you and talking about why we as Americans have won the lottery of citizenship. If there should be happy warriors anywhere on earth, they should mostly reside in America. Amen. Now, there there are some unhappy warriors out there, and, and I'm glad you were able to call in on this because I, I know this is an issue right in your real house, this, this banking situation out there. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and now today the reports about Credit Suisse and the uh, U.S. Treasury stress test. I mean, from your vantage point in the Senate, how do you see this shaping up? Well, one of the things we have to understand is what happened at SVB. The, the most important point that I don't see covered very well is that this bank and its executives and its board missed every clear yellow and red sign, every yellow and red flag that said trouble lurks ahead. When J.P. Morgan said in November, trouble lurks ahead, not a single regulator responded to it, not a single executive responded to it. When a blogger, when a financial blogger said in December, this portfolio is too risky and is going to have trouble not a single person did a thing. The first layer of failure is the bank executives and their board. The second layer of failure were the regulators. The regulators were talking about bitcoins and crypto and stable coins, but what they weren't doing were regulating the banks. They did not spend the time, the basic time, in understanding what was going wrong in the portfolio. They spent in this portfolio $5 billion on ESG. That is problematic. That's $5 billion more dollars that could have been on the baseline of this bank. So we see failures from the bank execs. We see failures from the regulators and the Biden economy. The Biden economy contributed in amazing ways to this bank failure. When your inflation goes to a 40-year high and the Fed responds with the fastest increase and interest rates, you should expect trouble in very conservative portfolios, and that's what happened with this bank. Yeah, this is the the part that struck me. We and I, I'm sure you and I we we'd have a, a long conversation about the Fed and how it does or doesn't do its work and how it could do better. But the thing that has just struck me the whole time is that 
whether I like Jerome Powell in the Fed or not, they started signaling months in advance, we think we're going to raise interest rates. And then they start yeah. raising interest rates, and they keep coming out with statements, we think we're going to do it again, and we think we're going to do it again. And it's like none of these people bothered to pay attention to a Federal Reserve that historically isn't very transparent, being really transparent about where they're headed. Absolutely. One of the things that you just said that should be taken seriously by all the executives that run, that run banks, when the Federal Reserve says we're going to increase interest rates, and then they increase them not once, not twice, not three times, not five times, but they have a consistent pattern of increasing interest rates, just know that deposits who are sitting on banks at 1% or 1.65%, they're going to flee to higher interest rates. That's going to create a liquidity bubble. That is not a capital issue. It's a liquidity issue. And that's exactly what the executive at SVB completely missed. Yeah, it, it, it's this is really striking. So now – where do you see the rest of the banking situation? My, my thinking is if, if First Republic, which also had a real stress test with a run on it, survives, that uh, maybe this situation contains itself? I do believe that we should expect a little more volatility than we've seen so far. But one of the things that we should all be talking about is the safety and the confidence we have in our overall financial system. As a result of 2008 and 2009, we saw a strengthening of the capital standards. We saw new tests. All we have to have are regulators that follow the law and apply the law. We'll be better off. But the banks that we have today are safer than they've ever been. Now, here's the an anomaly in the system. This bank, SVB, had only 6% of their deposits covered by FDIC. The average regional bank is between 50 and 70 percent. In other words, they have a very diversified portfolio. This one bank was so focused on the tech sector that they missed all the clear signs of a fall coming. And so when you think about other banks like that with the same focus and the same level of diversity, it is going to lead to a huge issue. This is not it is not a typical regional bank. Our regional banks are safe, they are well capitalized, and they do not have the same liquidity issues. This was a commercial bank, not a regional bank. And unfortunately, in today's society, the left trying to cover their backside, they are conflating the two as if they are one. Mm. And then their rush to judgment arms out the window of finding a buyer. Having spoken to the regulators over the weekend, the one thing we cannot understand is why they weren't willing to entertain all offers. That is a right. question and a mystery. Yeah, I, I, I've read about that one. And, and let me let me switch gears here. Well, well it, and hopefully we can resolve that mystery. But I have a concern. And, and it, when when Senator Leffler was in the Senate, she came on several times, and I talked to her about this. And she had the concern, and and during COVID with shutdown and PPP and bailouts, and uh, at the time was just like we got to move fast, and and yet could cause problems. And and I think we're seeing some of these problems happen of this moral hazard of when the government steps in to bail everybody out, the risk assessments go out the window because they know Uncle Sam will take care of them. And you can argue that, well, the depositors all needed to be taken care of. But if you know the Fed's going to come in and take care of all the depositors every time so no one's ever going to lose money, then where does the due diligence on the bank lie when Uncle Sam's just going to take care of everything? Eric, you, you raised one of the most important questions of the day and of the weekend, frankly. This is the moral hazard I was talking about over the weekend, and, and I think on, the, on, on Trey Gotti's show. This is corporate cronyism at its best, which is terrible for taxpayers. Anytime you foreshadow unlimited FDIC insurance, even though you know it ends at $250,000, you should expect more bad actors making bad decisions. This is a perverse incentive for bad behavior. And that's what we see there. And what we also need to understand is that the COVID money drove up deposits at a pace we have never seen before. And one of the tragedies is when you go from a mid-sized $50 billion bank, as SVB was just a few years ago, to over $200 billion, 
if you invest that extra deposit into very conservative securities and then the interest rates rise and rise and rise, seven increases, you are now facing a liquidity challenge that you can't climb out of. Yeah, it just – I'm I was talking to a, a great friend of mine I've known for years um, – just a financial whiz, got hired at Goldman Sachs, now works for a private equity firm in New York. And he and I were having this conversation maybe a year ago now that he says the outside world cannot appreciate how many zombie companies are out there that should be bankrupt, but between the COVID money and the like, they've just been able to stay in business and they've never fixed their mistakes. And at some point, we're going to have a problem when these financial companies begin to go out of business, expecting the government's just going to step in and bail them out again. And it, it seems like the rich, for all the Democratic talk about income inequality, they sure do like to bail out a bunch of rich people on Wall Street. That's exactly right. Two, two very important points there, Eric. Number one, the average American has around $5,000 in their banking accounts. We are now going to see special assessments, maybe as high as 200 plus billion dollars that will subsidize accounts that had balances of five million dollars. Venture capitalists are the most sophisticated, sophisticated investors in the world. We are seeing a transfer of wealth from rich, from the single moms to rich folks in Silicon Valley. Yeah, it, 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 it's so, I understand the the concerns of these businesses, they wouldn't be able to pay employees and it would have spillover effects, but it just seems like we, we continue to compound problems instead of letting the free market actually work. Uh, we, we've made it so David can never slay Goliath for David to be able to grow. You're exactly right, honestly, Eric. And the other point that you make that is very important, I hope all your listeners didn't miss that such an important point. Whenever the federal government bails someone out, you are asking others to get in and do what those folks that just got bailed out will do it again. We received calls as a leading Republican on the Senate Banking Committee. I have received calls from banks asking for unlimited, unlimited FDIC insurance. They're saying, listen, if you'll do it for those guys, we deserve it too. That is the spreading of the moral hazard in a way that this administration, because of their inaction from a regulatory perspective and too much action from printing and spending trillions of dollars, that combination is literally weakening the fabric of the average household. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so, Senator, I'm, I'm about out of time. If you're just joining, talking to Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, let me ask you one last question because I know you and I have talked about this privately. Um, there's a growing movement on the left to try to get banks across the country to stop doing business with companies they don't like, particularly gun manufacturers and gun stores. Um, what can be done without the Republicans in control of the Senate? Is there anything that can be done to make banks not walk away from these companies? That's a great question, Eric. One of the questions I, I raised during the debate over the Georgia election law, the changes that Governor Kipp made were substantial, they were significant, and they improved the system. Not a single African-American voter had a complaint after the 2022 election. Kudos to strong conservative Republicans doing the right thing. What, one of the questions I asked was, why is it that banks want to be able to pick and choose winners when the United States Congress has said these businesses are all legal. They are trying to figure out in their world the favored versus disfavored industries. And what we know in their category of disfavored industries are those who support the Second Amendment. This is what I call common sense. I'm in favor of those industries that support my Second Amendment rights. The banks have come out with an ESG plus agenda that focuses on folks that they believe are in a disfavored position according to the radical left's philosophy. We are going to use oversight, and thankfully the House, the majority on the Financial Services Committee are Republicans, so they have the power of subpoena. 
myself and Chairman McHenry, we are working together in a collaborative effort to bring more sunlight and use their power of subpoena to bring in more of these rogue actors who want to not interpret and abide by the law, but they actually want to create the law on who should and who should not be banked. That is something we can put the light on, and winning elections will give us the majority to stop this craziness from spreading. Amen. Senator, it is always so good to talk to you. It really is. Thank you for stopping by. You explain what's going on so well. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. I look forward to seeing you in August, and hopefully you'll have me on the show before then. I absolutely guarantee it. Thank you so much. Senator Tim Scott, the great senator from the beautiful state of South Carolina. So my kid has a queen-size bed. We've got a king-size bed. We got him Bull and Branch sheets, and he's used them. He had, like, kid sheets, and now he's old enough he doesn't want the, the action figure sheets anymore. Well, we got lost because, I mean, the sheets look like our sheets, except they're queen-size sheets, and they got put in our closet, and the kid was in despair. We got him bowl and branch sheets. They've gotten softer and softer, and he's like, where are my real sheets? He refused to sleep until we found the real sheets because they're that soft. They're that good. They're made with a 100% organic cotton thread. They get softer in every wash. You can stay cozy all winter long with a set of bowl and branch sheets. They really are that good. We have them on multiple beds in our house. My goodness, my seriously, my kid, uh, he's finally like, my sheets are for kids. I'm I'm grown up now, and uh, it's just a, a step of quality above what he had, and now he's like, can't sleep without these sheets. They're designed to feel incredible for all sleepers. They're made without toxins. They're free of pesticides, formaldehyde, other chemicals. They fit the deepest mattress, too, which I love because we have a very thick mattress on our bed, and it fits. It doesn't, like, bunch up and then snap off in the middle of the night when you roll over. You can get 15% off your forced order Bowling Branch sheets when you use promo code ERIC at BowlingBranch.com. Exclusions apply. See site for details. That's Bowling Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, Branch.com. Com. The promo code is Eric, E-R-I-C-K. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. There is some breaking news. Uh, my buddy Congressman Chip Roy of Texas is uh, actually he's <laughs> I tell you, I was needling him that I'm going to Hilton Head next week, which was one of his favorite places, too. And he's like, oh, we're at the beach this week. But he's just Kim. His staff has just sent out a letter. He's endorsing Ron DeSantis for president, the first uh, major politician in America to endorse DeSantis, who's not even in the race yet, but we all know it's coming. Uh, to the phones, Michael, you're going to be up next on the Eric Erickson Show. Welcome, Michael. Good day. How are you, sir? Great. How about yourself? Good, good. I wanted to uh, get your opinion because uh, you're very wise, educated, and I would just love to hear what you think about this. And so uh, I was thinking um, Russia, when people talk about Russia and Ukraine, they're always talking about getting rid of Putin, and which I don't disagree. But Russia has always had a strong, uh, what they call a strong man. You know, every since uh, Kublai Khan, Ivan the Terrible, uh, Stalin, et cetera, et cetera, that region has always had a strong man. And so when you look at that region, I believe they call it the steppes. Um, in my humble opinion, it is very volatile because you've got Afghanistan, you've got Chechnya, you have all these warlords, you've got ISIS, you've got all these um, uh, uh, volatile. Yep. Michael? Michael? Your phone line just dropped, Michael. Uh, that wasn't on my end. That was on Michael's end. I don't know what happened. But to answer Michael's question uh, pretty specifically here, yeah, this is kind of what DeSantis is warning about. If you get rid of Putin, who comes after Putin? Probably someone more ruthless than Putin. Uh, the democratic situation in Russia has never been good. It's very much similar to the Chinese. These countries have never had a strong history of democracy. They've always had tyrants. The Chinese had emperors. Then they had Chiang Kai-shek uh, and the Chinese Republic. Uh, then they moved into the communists. The Russians went from uh, the, the Khans to the Tsars and from the Tsars to the Soviets and from the Soviets uh, to Putin with uh, Boris Yeltsin in between. It's You're not going to bring strong democracy to these countries. And if we toss Putin, who knows what we're going to get? Probably not something favorable. So we really should be careful about how we pursue 
uh, dealing with Russia, um, the Russians themselves, God knows what they're going to do. When we come back, the Cold War is turning into a semi-hot war between DeSantis and Trump. I've got the details for all of you. I have to pivot. I'll get to Trump and DeSantis here in a minute. But Aaron Rodgers is leaving the Green Bay Packers. That's a big news story, not just in sports. He's been there for years. They, I mean, think about it. They had Brett Favre forever. They got Aaron Rodgers. He went to the Super, won the Super Bowl with them once. Um, great quarterback. 39 years old, though. There's no way. I just never thought that he was going to retire the same year Tom Brady retired and be overshadowed. Uh, he wants his own year, so he'll go to the New York Jets. Seriously? So I, I my, my my CFO is a dirty Mets fan and a Jets fan. Um and <laughs> he he loves losers, I guess. Uh, but he works for me, so what does that say? Uh but the Mets, they got Steve Cohen and and they are building a World Series team. They are building that team. The Jets, well, they they would love they haven't been to the World Series since 1969 or not the World Series, the Super Bowl. The Jets are a football team, the Super Bowl since 1969. And so it's it's fitting that Aaron Rodgers who does like um darkness camps and and psychedelics or what have you, hallucinogenics to I mean, he would go to a team that hadn't been to the Super Bowl since the hippies were in charge. Um 1960. I just it's it's a thing. I am an owner of the Green Bay Packers. I get a certificate on my wall and nothing else. I it's kind of cool though. I can say I'm an owner of the team. I get absolutely nothing other than I gave them some money for a certificate to put on my wall. It's kind of the it's the football equivalent of remember when you were kids and your grandparents would put your name in the International Star Registry and you would have a star named after you or you thought I don't know if that place has gone belly up or not. My college roommate Brian had a had a it was actually a very beautiful certificate designating some star somewhere in the universe as, as Brian's star. And, I mean, you even kind of then use like, really? This is for real? No, I'm sorry. If you have one of these, just tell yourself it's real. But outside of the International Star Registry, no scientists. <laughs> I mean, I've got I've got a planet named after me. that Y'all refer to it as Uranus, but that would be me. <laughs> Oh, dad jokes. Okay, let's move to, speaking of Uranus, let's talk about Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis fighting each other. <laughs> hey, y'all may not find it funny, I do. Um, So Trump has decided he is going to nuclear war with Ron DeSantis, the Politico. Has this story? Is this from? Yeah, Meredith McGraw has this. Trump's T. Okay, stop, pause, time out. The most remarkable thing in these stories to me, the most remarkable thing is Trump's team tells everybody everything. There's no surprise. Everyone can see what's coming and they can prepare. This, honest to goodness. Okay. Let me roll this back. Roll the tape back. When you run for office, I have run campaigns. And it really doesn't matter. Presidential all the way down to dog catcher. They start the same way, even if they start to different degrees. But typically with a well-prepared campaign, you bring the wife and your best friends you sit down in a room after a private investigator has investigated the snot out of you. Private investigator, a private investigator hired by the campaign goes out to dig up every possible bit of dirt. And then you sit in a room with your wife, your best friend, you have some drinks, and you essentially do a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, except it's modified a little bit. First, the candidates go through their strengths, everything that really sets them apart. And then, this is why the spouse is there, you go through the weaknesses. And all of the things on which you're weak, and that's where the opposition research comes in, all the hits the other teams can make at you. 
And then you do the analysis of your strengths versus who you think is your major opponent's strengths and your weaknesses versus their. And you see very graphically on a wall somewhere on a chart, how do you elevate your key strengths above your opponent's weaknesses to highlight their weaknesses by elevating your strengths? And how do you minimize your your weaknesses to their strengths? How do you elevate your strengths in such a way that minimize your weaknesses? And then you fl- you tend to get a theme out of that. You you tend to get an idea of how to sell yourself from that. And from there, you get your campaign theme. You get your campaign message, and everything ties back into that. And your strategist then, every campaign has a key strategist. Your strategist can take that work, your strengths and weaknesses versus the other people in the field and can build a campaign strategy. And this is a campaign strategy that is not from now until the primary season is over, but from now until the general election. And you modify it somewhat once you get through the primary because you've got to pivot to a different candidate once you're through the primary. But the message largely stays the same all the way through the primary and the general election. And you build a campaign. These are the, This is what we're going to do. Here is our strategy. We're going to sell our candidate in this way. We're going to do that with these tactics. There's a strategy, and the strategy deploys tactics to carry out the strategy. Some campaigns confuse the strategy and the tactics, and they just do a series of tactics with no overarching strategy. The winning campaigns are the campaigns that have an overarching strategy. They have an end goal. We're going to be the nominee. Here's the way we're going to do it. Here's the message we're going to deploy. Here's how we're going to design our TV. Here's how we're going to design our radio. Here's what our look is going to be. Here's what it's going to sound like. They put all of this in writing, and then they design the tactics so that anybody, if the strategist drop dead tomorrow. You've got it in writing. The new guy can come in, read the campaign strategy report and say, all right, let's keep firing on cylinders. Here's our tactics to be able to do this. I would imagine the DeSantis team has hired an opposition research person to dig up all the possible dirt on Ron DeSantis and to do so with the most negative possible framing. And then the campaign strategy sits around, the strategists sit around, the campaign sits around with the candidate, and they figure out ways how to neutralize those attacks. What is unique here, what is different here, and what sets this apart from everything else is that the Trump team cannot help itself but advertise its attacks and say, here's where we're going to hit you. Heads up over there. Wave our hands. We want you to see here's where we're going to go. And it's not a deflection. It's not like they're doing this to distract you from a different attack. They're actually doing it. The Trump team notoriously cannot keep secrets. So we get this from Meredith McGraw. Trump's team and his allied PAC are preparing an expansive opposition research file by poring over DeSantis's record as a prosecutor, member of Congress, and Florida governor. Among the items a Trump allied group has drilled into is DeSantis's record while serving as an assistant U.S. attorney before returning for congressional office with plans to accuse him of being an extremely lenient prosecutor in cases involving child pornography. They've conducted focus groups and looked at polling to hone in on the best messaging to take on DeSantis, and they've wasted no time to get organized and scoop up talent in key primary states. The team itself has felt like he has had a free ride without scrutiny for a number of years, says Brian Lanza, who worked on Trump's 2016 campaign and remains close to Trump's team. Just because he's aggressive and willing to fight doesn't make him MAGA. MAGA is the policies, and there's a tremendous amount of sunlight between Trump policies and DeSantis policies. The more and more that gets highlighted, the more DeSantis is going to get exposed as just another member of the establishment and compared to Jeb Bush. The preparations are the latest sign of a bruising primary fight to come, one that could make the 2016 primary fireworks look tame in comparison. It's a high-risk, high-reward play. The child pornography charges, for one, mirror those used by Republican senators against Katanji Brown-Jackson. In the DeSantis case, his contemporaries have insisted that the plea deals he signed were not unordinary. 
to make any allegation that he was soft of any on any kind of case, especially child porn, is just ludicrous. It defies the logic of what I saw in the office or what my office would let happen. Ronald Henry, retired U.S. attorney who served as supervisor to DeSantis when he was a special assistant U.S. attorney, told Politico he wasn't a lone wolf on his own making deals without the entire weight of the U.S. attorney overseeing what he did. Already, Trump has seen several notable defections from his camp, with some describing the ex-president's antics as childish. Trump was a good policy guy, and I'd put him up there with Ronald Reagan on policy, but presidentially he was a disaster. The way he acted, calling people names, says former Congressman Tom Marino, who co-chaired his 2015 campaign in Pennsylvania, is now supporting DeSantis. Trump hasn't waited to get started on what is expected to be a major anti-DeSantis broadside. He made digs at the Florida governor's backpedaling on raising the retirement age and privatizing Social Security and Medicare. He's flouted unsavory questions about DeSantis' time as a teacher in Georgia. And he's considered different nicknames from Ron to Sanctimonious to Ron DeSantis to Sanctus to Meatball Ron and told reporters that one was just too crude. <laughs> um, all right. The fact that they're telegraphing everything in advance isn't really helpful because it, it gives DeSantis a heads up of where to go. Part of me honestly has wondered, is the Trump team full of DeSantis sleeper cells? I, I suspect that's going to be a complaint at some point internally from the Trump team. Is his campaign full of sleeper cells for Ron, uh, De, I started to say Ron Johnson, uh, Ron, Ron De, uh, De, DeSantis? Because it's his campaign is full of people who can't keep their mouth shut when it comes to DeSantis, and they're out there telling reporters on background, here's our attacks, here's where we're going to go, here's the information we have. Hey, Ron, how are you going to respond to it? It's 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 kind of – it's it's so unprofessional. It's kind of what you expect, honestly, from the Trump team these days. But how does it help Donald Trump to have – his team out there saying, uh, do, 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 telegraph, telegraph, Ron DeSantis, here's all of our opposition research. Here's where we looked. Here's where we're going to attack you. I know some of you are thinking this can't be it. Surely they're doing this as a distraction. Surely they're telling DeSantis we're coming for you on child porn as a U.S. attorney, but actually we're going to hit you over here. No, they're, this is what they've done the whole time. You're not going to teach an old dog new tricks. Trump just kind of like buckles down and plows through with everything. Here's what we're going to do. And he says it over and over and over and over and over. The truth doesn't matter. And, you know, one of the other defections from Trump is Ken Cuccinelli, good friend of mine, former Attorney General of Virginia, and he's now started uh, Never Back Down, a Trump's uh, DeSantis Super PAC. They're headquartered here in Atlanta where I am. And he's got this quote, DeSantis leads the fight against the woke left, but Trump wants him removed from office because DeSantis's book outsold Trump's book in the words of President Trump. Sad. Uh, this, this is where we're headed. I just I, I think people are going to be rolling their eyes at all of this stuff. I, and I don't think it's going to have the impact the Trump team thinks it's going to have. But they have set their sights on DeSantis. Now, interestingly enough, think about Kentucky. Think about Kentucky. Um, in Kentucky, eight years ago now, Matt Bevan became governor. He was opposed by Mitch McConnell because Bevan had run against McConnell in 2014. But you had a, a four-way race in 2016, or a three-way race in 2016, the Republican primary. And the front runner and the second-place guy tore each other to pieces, just destroyed each other. And the result is they eliminated each other, and Matt Bevan in third place at 10% of the polls finished first. That could happen with the other candidates. Trump and DeSantis could destroy each other. Nikki Haley, to some degree, her campaign has suggested that's one of the things they think could happen. The Pence campaign, too, thinks that's something that could happen. Trump and DeSantis could annihilate each other and allow a third party to become the Republican nominee. It is possible that happen. it happened in Kentucky. It happens in more races than you think. People get tired of, of the mudslinging from the front two guys. 
It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Now, what is also playing out out there while we're we're saying all this is all the economic turmoil. The Dow is down almost 400 points today. People are moving to gold to try to get some stability in their portfolio. And if you're interested at all, consider my friends at Advantage Gold. 800-450-2566 is their number. 800-450-2566. They are TrustLink's number one highest rated gold company seven years in a row. They got the best prices, the best staff, the best IRA department of the country. They can help you protect your retirement account today. They can help you with your 401k, your IRA, your general investment strategy using gold to ease the ebbs and flows of wild stock markets and inflations. 800-450-2566 is their number. They've got the best solutions out there. That, I mean, they answer stuff so well. I, I When I was vetting them, because so many of you wanted me to find a reputable gold company, they had a great reputation, but I didn't want a gimmicky company. I wanted one that will just answer your questions. If you're at all interested in gold, they're not going to twist your arm. There's no hard sell. They just want to answer your questions, and they believe in answering your questions. You'll put your faith in them. That's what Advantage Gold does. That's why I went with them. 800-450-2566. No gimmicks, just straight answers on how you can use precious metals in your portfolio. 800-450-2566. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. Too late for the phone number, not enough time to take any more calls. That's all right. I still got a whole lot of stuff I wasn't able to get to. I want to circle back, go full circle, in fact, to the beginning of the program. And the issues with the attacks on DeSantis from the GOP. Here's what I think is going on here. Uh, Republicans right now... The base of the party, the candidates, the politicians, they're trying to figure out the future of the party. How much further do they go towards populism or nationalism, towards Trump or away from Trump or back to what they were before Trump? Everybody's got a dog in the fight, it seems. They can't accept reality that Trump did, to some degree, realign the Republican Party. Some of them are trying to wrestle it back uh, to a party they recognize, and I just don't know that that's going to happen. I mean, this this is Adam Kinzinger on CNN. You know, I think right now the majority of Republicans, for instance, support Ukraine. That number changes because they don't hear from Republican leaders who support Ukraine because they're for some reason scared to talk about it with a few exceptions. They're only hearing from Tucker Carlson, from Donald Trump, and now Ron DeSantis, who says we don't get involved in territorial disputes. So that makes me question, you know, what's his position on Taiwan and China for things like that. So, you know, I think DeSantis' advantage right now is he's kind of like anybody that is ready to move on from Trump. He kind of gives people an out to be like, yeah, I'm still cool. I want to own the libs, but it's time to move on from Trump. The problem is I don't think DeSantis has the personality that Trump has. And as they start butting heads and going head to head, I really expect that Donald Trump will start kind of wiping the floor with Ron DeSantis in terms of that. But, you know, I I think some of these guys are so defined by Trump. That's the other angle here. Some of the guys, Kinziger in particular, is so defined by Donald Trump that if Donald Trump goes away, what do they do with themselves? I mean, how do they make money? They are defined by their opposition to Donald Trump. They've got to root for Trump the bulwark crowd and the like. They've got to root for Donald Trump's success or or they're no different from the rest of the Democrats out there. They've defined themselves in opposition to Trump. And a lot of them desperately want Trump to be the Republican nominee because otherwise they can't make any money. They expose themselves as nothing more than an ordinary Democratic group. they got to have Trump. They're always Trump, even though they claim they're never Trump. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.